So, hello and welcome everybody to Humpy Hanger Presentations, uh, brought to you by supercup.org and the Not So Straight and Level podcast. Um, great to have you here. Uh, we got some really cool, two really great end of the year programs here. Um, tonight's program on Iceland which we'll talk about in just a minute with Hillary. And then next month, uh, Paul Claus has agreed to share with us about his trip to Greenland, where he flew his Cessna 180 out there in 2014. And um, a lot of amazing pictures. He just sent me four pictures, just kind of as a little teaser. And it's going to be incredible. Um, you know, Greenland is one of those places, sort of like Iceland. We know a little bit more about Iceland, but Greenland is one of those places we don't know a lot about. And I think that's going to be a really great presentation. Um, so speaking of presentations for tonight's presentation, whether you're watching on YouTube or you are watching on uh, Zoom, you can either use the Zoom chat to ask questions uh, or you can use the YouTube chat. I'll be monitoring uh, both of those as we go along here this evening. So tonight's guest is uh, Hillary Lex and Hillary Lex is a photographer and videographer currently based out of Bentonville, Arkansas. Her husband, Harry, became a pilot in 2017, at which point Harry started to become connected in her, uh, Hillary became, started to become connected in her own special way to aviation. Hillary launched Trip Pool Media in 2020 with a childhood friend, and their first official client was none other than the Bentonville FBO, Thaden Field. Their first short film was titled Harry Flies Oz. Her company now primarily produces storytelling and branding videos for small businesses and outdoor organizations. Hillary was also certified by Photographers Without Borders after completing a storytelling school in Jodhpur, India, which I probably mispronounced. On a personal note, she's a sucker for taking adventurous risks in the spirit of creating rad memories. She loves anything outdoors and anything that involves traveling to new places, especially international ones. So, uh, Hillary, can you uh, turn on your video there so people can? Yes? Come in. Come in. Oh, well, she's right here. That makes it easy. Hey, guys. Hey, Steve. How's it going? So, here we are. Here, um, I just join you right here? I think it'd be fantastic. Okay, cool. So, uh, we actually see a lot of Hillary and of Harry since I work with Harry some, sometimes, some of the time, not when he's in his flying thing. Um, so Hillary recently went on this adventure to Iceland and she's going to talk a little bit about some of that. One of the things I asked her to do, um, you know, a lot of our uh, presentations are very aviation centric and I really wanted to. Uh, I really wanted her to give us a feel of what it's like just to kind of tour around and be in Iceland when you're not flying. I mean, we see all these amazing pictures of from up above and all these other places. And uh, I just thought it was a good idea to maybe get an idea of, of what it's like when, uh, when you're not flying. So um, she's going to show us a little bit of that as well. And of course, there will be some flying also. Mm -hmm. So um, Hillary, you can uh, take it away anytime you're ready. Yeah, sure. And I hope this will be very much a conversation, Steve. Um, so interrupt me at literally any time and uh, ask ask away. But I do have a little bit of uh, visual aid that I've prepared about my recent trip to Iceland uh, that I thought I would share with you folks. So um, let's just dive right in. What I want to share with you, let me get this stuff out of the way. Um, so what I want to share with you, first of all, I know Steve mentioned that um, love traveling. This is this is the pilot that he mentioned, Harry Lex, my husband. Um, we love traveling all over the globe. Uh, this is, you know, over here you got Chile. We did the W Trek. We got Argentina there on the bottom right. We got us flying in Costa Rica with some parasailing, right? So um, one of the things that I uh, found for myself was this love for photography through adventure. So any way that I can effectively document uh, what we're doing and how we're adventuring around the globe, um, that, that has been my goal. So um, enter Iceland into the picture. And um, a lot of you may have heard or may not have heard of Chris Burkhard. So he's a pretty world famous photographer uh, that I had the pleasure of meeting in Oregon. Um, let's see, it was the fall of 2018. And I met him out there to do a photography camp, if you will, and learned a lot about aerial photography, which felt quite timely since Harry had just been flying now for over a year. 
So I thought, man, what a cool way to integrate my passion for photo and video to be able to learn how to do that from a plane with my husband. Um, and then Chris actually has done a lot of trips. I think he is the most well-traveled photographer to Iceland <laughs> at this point. Um, and many of you I'm sure have seen his phenomenal photos over the glacial rivers in Iceland. Um, and he recently released a book not too terribly long ago called At Glacier's End that talks a lot about um, the rivers and the geothermal activity in Iceland and photographs that from the air and gives you just a totally different perspective of this country that I think um, not many people had ever really seen before um, or at least had been exposed to before. And he really brought that to the forefront for folks. And I think he's probably one of the reasons Iceland became very um, popular from a travel perspective. So as soon as I saw a lot of his aerial photos over Iceland, it became a bucket list item. I have to get a photo like this, especially one after meeting him and hearing how he shoots from a plane. And then two, seeing these beautiful shots and knowing that I'm always trying to find like, what's that next cool shot. But I also like an artist, like if you see something you love, why not go chase it and get it for yourself? So uh, that is kind of the impetus for this uh, story and this trip to Iceland. Well, I a little bit of a downtime. A, a lot of folks have seen some of Chris Burkhardt's pictures. We had some of them in our calendar, Iceland shots of his nice. in the calendar a couple of years ago. And also, uh, here's another thing about Chris Burkhardt, uh, relative to what we were talking about Paul Claus for a minute ago. Um, he has just spent some time up in the Rangels with uh, Paul Claus. So I think you're going to be seeing some pretty cool images from that soon, too. Yeah, I can't wait to see those. Um, so what I thought I would do is kind of talk to you a little bit about how I travel Iceland. Um, so this is actually my second trip to Iceland. Um, I got to go back in the fall of 2018 also um, with my mother, my dear mother, and um, we had a wonderful mother-daughter trip, got to do a lot of adventurous fun things. Um, so this time around, I took two girlfriends with me and we uh, adjusted the itinerary. One, kind of through a photographer's perspective and what were some of those things that I wanted to hit that um, maybe I didn't get to the first time I was in the country. And then two, uh, because it was a few of me and my friends that were in our thirties and we wanted to do a lot more active activities. When I went in the past, it was a big road trip around the ring road. A lot of you have probably heard about the ability to do a trip around the ring road in a relatively short period of time and seven to 10 days, you can travel the entire um, country, which is pretty cool. Uh, but this time it was, I wanna spend more time in some of these places that I've been to before and have an opportunity to photograph them in a way that I just didn't have the time to do the first time around because we just had to keep getting to the next place. So this trip, um, the itinerary was different in the sense that we did not do the entire ring road. Instead, we chose to um, fly into Keflavik Airport, which is actually not in Reykjavik, it's, it's a bit south, and uh, then traverse the southern coast and go all the way out to a town called Hop. Um, some people may pronounce it Hafen, um, Icelandic folks, it's pronounced Hop, uh, and then go back. So backtrack our way across the Southern coast, because there's just so much to see in that area. And then we went up and around the Snilesfulness Peninsula. Um, so I, I, I thought I might share a little bit about just kind of what each day looked like. So you can start to visualize if you go to Iceland to go fly, um, there are a lot of other things that you should build in and um, very good reason to actually, to build in other things. Right. Do you, you know you, why? Yes, because the weather is like crappy 99% of the time. <laughs> it's not flyable. That's what I've heard anyway. Yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, so one thing I do want to note before I, I go into some of these things is um, what was really fun about this trip uh, was there were a lot of very spiritual moments for me because um, the only day that we could fly uh, that particular trip was the very last day I was there, just because, again, we're, we're traveling all over the southern coast and to coordinate with some pilots out there 
it really made the most sense to do it the last day we were on the island. Um, and so it was like the whole trip, I was just crossing my fingers. Like, I don't even know if this is going to work out. I'm, I'm keeping my expectations really low. So that being said, it's like, let's live it up the days that we can live it up. So day one, typically a trip to Iceland, like you're taking a red eye flight from the United States at least. And you're landing in like the 7 a.m. time frame or 6 a.m. So you get there. Um, one weird fact I learned is that when you're exiting restaurants that are right outside of security, departing passengers, you're not allowed to eat at those restaurants. Uh, so be aware of that. Uh, only if you're leaving, only if you're only if you're, um, leaving. So yeah, arriving, arriving passengers aren't allowed. If you're about to leave the airport and go to or Iceland, like you can't eat there. I don't know why this is a rule. They're missing out on so much income, um, potential income. It's if anybody knows, please tell me why this is a thing in this country. Um, but only, um, passengers that are about to depart Iceland can eat at the airports and, or the restaurants in Keflavik. So that being said, since you arrive at like seven in the morning after this red eye flight and you kind of got to get used to the day, the best possible way to do that is a stop at the famous Blue Lagoon. Um, there are a couple other really cool, uh, nice geothermal pools like this that have recently popped up. One um, is called Sky Lagoon. So I would highly recommend checking that one out the next time I go because I will go again. I'm going to try Sky Lagoon, so I'll keep you guys posted. But the Blue Lagoon, um, some of you may have heard of this place. It's a wonderful spot to just sit and relax, get clean, and just dive right into what Iceland is all about. Um, so Iceland sits, the island is just bubbling with geothermal activity, and that is their primary source of energy in the country. So there are a stunning amount of hot springs and thermal rivers that you can uh, play at all over the country. So um, oftentimes my friends that have never been to Iceland, like why, why Iceland? It's like, okay, well, um, hot springs all over the place, a lot of really cool hiking, stunning waterfalls, and the hiking that you do what I learned this trip is it's actually not terribly strenuous. And to get to some of these really beautiful waterfalls that require a hike, don't take very long. So uh, there's, there's just a lot of really cool things to do in this country, but this is the number one thing you should do. Um, also, there's a restaurant there that serves great food. It will be the most expensive meal you eat the entire time you're there. So just prep yourself for that. But the way I do it is you get the premium package, you get a robe, you get slippers, you go enjoy the pool, you get to eat lunch in your robe, and then you take a shower and you hit the road and you're off and you're ready to go on your trip. Um, you're totally refreshed from that red eye flight. Is there also a, uh, do you spend a day in class learning how to pronounce all of the places in Iceland? Because there's more Gosh. unpronounceable, there's more unpronounceable places in Iceland yeah. than anywhere else. Oh my word! That uh, so yes, that that language is crazy. <laughs> it's um, it's pretty difficult. And uh, it, so first time I went, no chance. Um, this time I decided I was going to be really proactive in asking the locals, "Am I saying this right?" or "How do you say this?" Some of them stuck, um, <laughs> some of them absolutely did not, which uh, you may hear me mess up here in a second. <laughs> so, so day one's all about refresh and then get to your Airbnb or wherever it is, get a good night's sleep that night, Take a, maybe take a Tylenol PM that night. I don't know, like take a Tylenol PM so you get a really good night's sleep so that the next day you're ready to go. Then day two, you're off to the races with just some really cool things. Um, day two, uh, to this day, I was there for 10 days. Day two may still be my favorite day. And I think it was also one of my favorite days when I went with my mom three years prior to that. Um, there is something very magical about this particular hike that you see right in the middle. Um, it's called the Reiki Delor Thermal River Hike. Uh, you park your car. And by the way, when I was there three years ago, it was just a dirt parking lot, nothing there. Um, I don't think many people knew about it yet or tourism hadn't hit yet. 
showed up this time, paved parking lot. You had to pay for parking, $10. Um, and there was a restaurant, bar, and outdoor clothing shop there. <laughs> So it, uh, tourism in Iceland is certainly catching up to the times, uh, which, which is good. It's a, I think it's a good thing. And uh, that is a big source of income for the country. Um, and the fact that there are these places that they're setting up, it, it's pretty cool. And I never have um, a problem or complain about like paying for national park access or paying for parking at a place that's stunning. Um, at the end of the day, it's just supporting the ability to keep it that way um, in my eyes. Uh, so thermal river hike, you'll see a little bit more about this in a second. Um, but you hike straight up essentially for about 45 minutes until it levels off. So prepare for that one a bit. It's, it's kind of hard right at the beginning. You really are going straight up, but take your time because around each corner of this hike, there is something beautiful to look at. And then you get to a point where you um, strip down to your skivvies, put your swimsuit on, and you literally sit right in this river. And you see how we were dressed. We had on our, our down coats. It was actually quite windy that day, um, but it was so fun to, to be able to get into this hot river and just soak. And again, like what a better way to start day two. Uh, and then we, we, after the thermal river hike, we went and ate in a greenhouse. Um, and it's called Friedheimer and they have, uh, it right behind here. You see my, me and my friend, Laura, um, those are tomatoes growing and you, everything they serve has tomatoes in it. <laughs> um, it's actually the best, probably one of the best bowls of tomato soup I've ever had. I don't know if it was because it tasted so good or if it was just because the experience was that cool, you know, and I, I'm sure you've had, we've all had those types of experiences where it's like, just the setting made it food. Maybe it was good. Maybe it wasn't. I don't remember that part, <laughs> but, um, it, it was a really cool bowl of tomato soup. So I'm going to, I'm going to jump over here and you'll see a little bit more of these things that I've mentioned. So here's a, um, we're jumping over into a quick little drone video that you can see a little bit more of this, um, hot, hot spring river that I'm referring to. You see that they have you know, the wooden platform to take you all the way uh, once you get up there. And then you see they have these different things set up so that you can change um, privately. And then you hike back down. It was stunning. Highly recommend this one. This is a do not miss. By the way, we were there. It was a perfectly clear day. Um, we were there at probably 8.39 in the morning. And there were maybe a handful of people there. It was not busy at all. That's one of the things I also love about this country is there's a lot you can do. Um, and some places there's a lot of tourists, uh, the places that you read about in a book, but the exploration here is endless. Um, and there's plenty of places you can go where you will not run into more than a handful of people, <laughs> which I think is really special. So get there while it is still like that. All right, so you also saw, I had said that on um, day two, So you can just hear the excitement. Um, we ended the day at this place called Runalog Hot Spring. We'd heard about um, Secret Lagoon, looked it up. It was only open for an hour um, by the time we were in the area. Uh, so I said, well, let's skip Secret Lagoon. Plus you have to pay 25 bucks to get in. I found this place called Runalog Hot Spring just by like going in real tight on Google Maps. It, I, I, like mind blowing, this place was, Again, very magical, kind of like, wait, do trolls live here? Or is this a fairy cabin? <laughs> um, where have we found ourselves? And one of the biggest tips, by the way, so you see in this picture in the right, we actually cooked our dinner in this hot spring. Um, and again, this was one of those spots where we were maybe one of 10 people there. And so it just felt so intimate and magical. Like, how are there not more people here? This is so cool. Um, so one of my big tips, 
food and groceries. So restaurant or groceries in Iceland, it's way expensive. Um, can you guess what like a bowl of just standard tomato soup might cost you? Mm, $10. On average, about 25 Wow! for just a bowl of soup. Um, one thing I did notice was prices seemed uh, this time around to be a little bit lower. Like I had fish and chips and a beer at a really great pub. Um, a friend of mine said, oh, let me guess. That was 52 bucks. And it was only $30. Okay. So, so I don't know if we're in like a post pandemic depression of pricing in that country a little bit on the food side, but that being said, my big tip is pack your own food if you can. So we we love um, packing good, good to go camp meals. That's my favorite. I'm not a like brand partner or sponsor. I promise. It's just good to go is like the brand that I found that has the best flavor. Um, let me know if you have other uh, camp meals that you really like the freeze dried camp meals. But uh, I took my jet boil with me. And then each of us took our own camp meals with us. And I bought a tank of propane at a gas station when we landed. And then we were able to cook our own meals on the go. Did you bring the meals with you from the U.S.? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I just made like a, a bulk REI order before I left. So I spent maybe 125 bucks on food. And then we pre-planned when we knew we were going to be eating out on the trip and about how much it would be costing. Gotcha. So it, it was a nice way to balance some cost in that way. Um, and it, it's just something to think about. So, and then of course the last one is the highlight of that day was this horse uh, just kept wanting to get this. This lasted for probably like five minutes, y'all. This horse and I just sitting there kissing one another. Um <laughs> And that, that was pretty cool. Uh, I, <laughs> fun fact is Icelandic horses are Icelandic horses and nothing else. Like Icelandic horses are unique to that island. No horses come into the country. No horses leave the country. This breed is specific <laughs> to Iceland. So it is when people talk about like, I want to see an Icelandic horse. It, it does mean something. <laughs> so keep your eye out. And they're very friendly. Don't feed them, but like they come up and they just come and talk to you and they kiss you. It's fantastic. <laughs> All right. So um, moving on, here's just a, a kind of an epic shot of a canyon with a massive waterfall. This is like, this is classic Iceland, guys. Um, and this is not far from Reykjavik. This is Golfoss and it actually sits right inside of the golden circle. So it's very easy and quick to get to. Um, when it comes to um, like getting there from the airport or Reykjavik, you're talking about maybe an hour, hour and a half to get there. Uh, so if you're looking to stay in and around that particular area, there's just, there's still so, so much to see without having to drive all the way in if you don't want to do that. Um, all right. So this is the one that kind of brings to life why you need to plan other things to do when you're in Iceland, aside from I'm just going to go there and, and fly my plane or um, do some Highlands flying with, with uh, some Super Cup pilots out there, which there is a community of them out there, which is pretty cool. I'm sure literally all of you know that. Um, so wind. All right, that, that wind, that lasted literally all day long. Um, that was not like, oh, it's just windy this morning. Let's, you know, let's go chill out and maybe do something uh, else until the wind dies down. This, uh, and by the way, for those that have never met me, I'm 5'11", I'm 145 pounds. Like I'm not, I'm not a, a small lady. Like I can, I can handle handle myself just fine. Um, but the wind is crazy and it you don't know when it's gonna show up. Like the weather's pretty un, 
predictable there. So I think it's just, you know, it's important to know that um, that will happen. Don't let it deter you from getting out there and adventuring because there's, you can still get out there and hike. Just make sure you have the right gear for it. Like have a Gore-Tex jacket, hard shell that's windproof. You can see here on the right, I have like my Patagonia torrent shell, like waterproof, windproof pants. Um, and as long as you have the right gear with you, you will be fine and still adventure and have a ton of fun. Don't let it like scare you from all there is to see in Iceland. You were getting blown back onto the ledge. They're not being blown off of it. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was pushing me back and I was trying to like care, <laughs> carefully edge my way up to try to get a picture. To be clear, my pictures from this particular spot turned out terribly. I needed to really increase that shutter speed, but still, I don't know if it would have done anything and trying to pull the tripod out there. Silly. Just don't do it. Um, so it's pretty cool, but, uh, just be aware that like you will get 40, 50, 60 mile per hour gusting winds. Um, and there's not much you can do about it and you just got to kind of go with the flow. But that being said, when it's really windy out, a really good place to go is into a Canyon where you are shielded from all that wind. So uh, we explored a lot of canyons that day. We just happened to be in the right area um, where there were a couple canyons I'd never been to that I wanted to see and explore. And again, y'all, um, if anyone has any questions after all of this is said and done or wants my itinerary, I am so happy to share it with you. Um, it, I did a lot of research, dug in, did a lot of Google earthing to find some things, um, have a couple photographer friends that go to Iceland quite a bit and said, please tell me where this spot is. Um, but it, it was a lot of work. So the canyons, I, I don't even know if I can explain how special these spots are. This is another one of those where it's like, yeah, fairies, fairies definitely live here. Um, <laughs> we have found where the myths of fairies come from. Okay. So, but I can't explain it. I just need to show you. Who's that goofy person? Yeah, so that's that was me on like a high of all highs. Like I, there's nothing like exploring something I've never seen before. Um, going in, there weren't any other people in this canyon. And on the right, you could see we had to like at one point get on a chain and climb up a rock wall. And I mean, there is nothing like that will, that will make my heart explode the way that that does. Um, seeing something, exploring something new. And so I just couldn't, I couldn't hold it in. I had to like, my I saw my friend recording and I just had to sprint at her and be like, this was so, so cool. Um, that canyon, if you need the name, let me know. I have it on my phone. I can pull it out and look it up. Um, I don't think I could pronounce it, but I will. That's one I, I couldn't pronounce. Um, but I will share it with all of you because it is it is worth it. Prepare to get a little bit wet though. Like when you go into any of these canyons, I, I wore um, gaiters and I had my waterproof oboes. Um, some of you know oboes shoes from Montana. I love oboes. So I had my waterproof oboes. I had my waterproof gaiters, my waterproof pants. I mean, I, you know, you prepare for it. So again, so a lot of Iceland is about, do you have the right gear? to at any point come across any weather element. All right, let's keep going. We're about to get, I think, to some really fun, cool stuff. Because you know, it's been so boring so far. <laughs> um, so some of you may recognize this. These um, are the basalt columns at Reynas Fiara Beach, um, which is a black sand beach. So a uh, quick story about this. So this was the morning after the crazy windy day. We scored an incredible cabin on Rainus Friar Beach, like right on it. Found it on Airbnb. 
Um, it far exceeded our expectations. We got in there and I thought we um, were about to experience a hurricane or something. Like the wind was just smacking against our cabin and the windows and rattling everything. I hadn't experienced wind like that. The, like the last time I went to Iceland, nothing. It was kind of scary. Um, we were worried about our car, our rental car. Like, I hope it's going to be okay. Uh, is hopefully we don't wake up in the morning. There's broken windows. Like this is crazy. And so all with that, there was a lot of rain and a lot of cloud cover. And so the next morning I, like I had looked up the weather app, um, and it said it was going to be cloudy. And so I was really bummed because Reina Sfiara beach is a beautiful place for landscape photographers. Um, and I really wanted to fly the drone there, but it's like in this wind, no chance. So, uh, woke up the next day and it was, I had set my alarm a little later cause I'm like, the weather looks terrible. Um, but this again, it's a testament to the weather actually being very unpredictable. Woke up, peeked out and I saw it was actually incredibly calm outside. I started to see the sun peaking a bit and saw the color shooting across the sky. And I said, guys, get dressed. I'm sprinting to the beat. Like I didn't even, I don't think I brushed my teeth. I grabbed a camera, grabbed the drone. I put on my down coat, put on my shoes. I'm pretty sure I was still in my pajamas. And I just like, I sprinted down to the beach and, um, Oh, this is, you'll see here in a second. So waterfalls, hikes. Oh no. Hold on. I promise. I can't believe that just happened. Okay. I'll find the picture. It was amazing. So <laughs> rain is far a beach. The build up was amazing. It was picture. amazing. Watch this. <laughs> I bet I can find it really fast. So the point is, is that like, I was incredibly thrilled that at the end of the day, rain is far a beach far exceeded my expectations. And um, coming back there a second time, it was very special to actually um, be able to see the beach in different light. Here's the, here's the picture right here. So there you go. So you, oh, there it is. Wow. Yeah. I'm gonna drag that thing up out of the way there, that, that, this bar here. Cool. Technical difficulties. There you go. All right. So there is. Nice. There's the, the the shot with the beautiful light. Um, the last time I was there, we were there a little bit later than sunrise and the sun was just kind of piercing through. And so it just looked different. So having three years on kind of my experience as a photographer and learning a few other things, this was very exciting for me personally. And it also is something that made me um, as a photographer, it's like, man, I have to keep coming back to this place because uh, each of these locations, depending on, you know, if you hit the weather right, or which you'll see some of this in a second, if you hit the weather right, it could or could not be stunning. Um, if you hit the time of day right, too, like depending on the season and where the sun is that time of year, like it's going to look completely different. So there's just endless opportunities also to photograph some of this stuff in totally different light, which is cool. All right. Let's keep rolling. This was kind of an example of those waterfall days. Um, this is Skogafoss on the right. Very famous. Uh, if you go to Iceland, you will go to Skogafoss. Um, every, everyone does. When you go to Skogafoss, play with your angles, with your whether it's with your phone or with your camera or you're zooming in um, or you're standing really far away. Uh, this is a place where people go and they see it and you can see it straight from ring road. Like you don't even need to pull in to see this waterfall. It's massive. Um, but it is worth playing with your angles on this one to get a shot that is just very different from what most people might get here. And then here's a fun fact. This waterfall, Kivirnafoss, is not even 500 meters from Skogafoss. <laughs> Like it is just, you know, a hop, skip and a jump down the way. We were there for two hours and saw no one else. Hmm. Like people go to Skogafoss, you will see hundreds of people there. 
And then uh, they just move on, they keep going. And they have no idea that this canyon and waterfall is literally right around the corner. Hmm. So it's something important to keep in mind with Iceland is um, don't underestimate, like like Google Maps is pretty cool these days. Like zoom in wherever you are and see if there's anything else there. And if there is, go check it out. Just go check it out because it's probably well worth it because the whole country is stunning. Hmm. All right. Any questions? I don't have any questions. If anybody has any questions, of course, you can ask questions in the chat. Yeah. All right. So they're either asleep or mesmerized. One of the two. One of the two. Oh, I see Lou, Lou Furlong's on. Hi, Lou. I'm about <laughs> to see your name pop up on screen over here. Ooh, Josh, here's one. Um, I love Iceland. Did you and your husband fly your plane out there? She's no. getting to that. Oh, man, we didn't. But I'll tell you more about this in a little bit. Um, you did a photo trip. I would love to see your photos, Josh, actually. Um, we, no, so we did not fly our plane out there. I flew since I was just with um, me. And I've not convinced my husband to go with me to Iceland yet. He does not like cold weather. He's a desert dweller. Uh, he grew up in Phoenix, Arizona. So he is very, very warm blooded. Um, I will. I, it is on, it, that is also on my to-do list. My fervent to-do <laughs> list is to convince Harry um, to come with me to Iceland. And I think that would be the way to do it. So let's talk, Josh. Um, but no, I, I flew Iceland Air direct from Denver, actually. Um, and it was, it, the flight over there is just six hours. It was great. So this photo right here is an example too of, um, so Vesterhorn or Stokesness is a um, beautiful mountain that has stunning views. And it, there's this water, the tide comes in and there's water that uh, you can walk on. So it, it gives you this walk on water effect. And behind you is this like magnificent, huge mountain that just like shoots up out of the ocean. It is phenomenal. I was so excited about it. And we woke up for sunrise to go, fog couldn't see anything. Complete fog. So that's the mountain behind there. That, yeah, the yeah. mountain is right there, I promise. <laughs> I promise the mountain is there. Unfortunately, um, this was this was one where I, I started to get just a little defeated because I'm like, I can't believe I'm not going to see Vesterhorn this trip. Like that makes me really sad because it's beautiful. Um, but it was, a, again, a good example of where you have to shift and kind of change your perspective a little bit and think about, okay, we're here. How am I going to think about this differently? And how I'm going to, how am I still going to photograph what we experienced this morning? Um, so this was an example of how we just had to shift perspective and, and take what we got that day. Right. And then we went ice caving. Um, wow. This was the coolest shot I got ice caving. And this is also one I would highly recommend do if you're going to ice cave in Iceland, um, which you should do, uh, I would really recommend doing more research. So um, I would talk to someone, uh, call these companies and ask them about what, what are the ice caves that we can go to where we actually have to drive onto the glacier and hike out onto the glacier to get into some of the deeper ice caves. This was one um, where we drove on a four wheel road for a while. And it, it was just quite frankly, it was quite busy. Uh, and we did not get to spend a lot of time there. And as a photographer, that's a bit of a bummer because you want time to look at your angles and look at different ways to, you know, photograph the area and the moment. Um, so this is like, rad photo, I, I think, uh, but the only photo that I got from this ice cave that I was remotely proud of. Hmm. But, you know, not bad. Isn't it kind of freaky to be down in there? So. Yeah, like, <laughs> it, it's <laughs> like, actually, so. It could all move and shift around. Could. It technically, yeah, absolutely, because when we left this ice cave, like, you literally just walk right in, and, and there you are. Like, that, that is the sky, right, in, in the top of that photo water is dripping on you the whole time. It's hmm. like you've stepped in this cave and it started raining. Um, and so, yes, the ice is actively melting and we hiked out 
and we got, I don't know, maybe a hundred meters down the way. And, um, he said, yeah, just three years ago, the glacier went out to here and it was like, wait, hold on. What? Um, and it just kind of put into perspective how quickly these glaciers do lose, um, and how, how that happens throughout the years. So yeah, it is, it is a little freaky, which is, Hey, to my point, why you would want to go to one deeper into the glacier. That's probably a a bit more more stable. stable. Yeah. But it, it just, this particular one felt like they were kind of like herding cows or sheep or what's the phrase? Herding cats. Herding cat. Yeah, sure. Herding cats. It was like, groups of 10 to 15 people at any given and then it's like come here look at this I'll take your photo don't let the guide take your photo they were t- I saw where he was positioning people I'm like this is terrible and my my friend Jackie um let him do it and they, they were just really bad just go off and try to get your own stuff when you're in there but it it was like we were in there and then we we're out and I was like really that was it so anyway this makes it look really cool um but that was the coolest part of the whole whole cave uh, here, cool thing about that cave is it sits on Jock Sarloon, uh, Jock Sarloon, I'm probably saying that wrong, um, lagoon, which is the biggest glacier in Iceland. And then there's this lagoon where all the glacier uh, melt is like breaking off. And then it actually is going out to the ocean to Diamond Beach. Um, it's called Diamond Beach because you have these massive glaciers that go out to the ocean and then the tide pushes these glaciers back up onto the beach. This is pretty magical. Um, I have some pretty cool photos from this one that I didn't include, but uh, thought the drone might bring it to life a little bit more. And by the way, we'll talk about this again later. I just want to make sure we don't forget to give them your social links because just the stuff that mm. you're posting on Instagram and it's just you know, phenomenal pictures from this trip and the other stuff that you do too. Yeah, thanks for sure. I do have on um, my website, I have an Iceland album, um, which has all these, most of the photos I've shared tonight and then some uh, where you can actually go look at those. And if there's one you're totally inspired by, you can buy if you want, Uh, plug for myself. But my my website is just hillarylex.com. And then you can click on the portfolio and go to the Iceland page um, if you if you want to check it out. So uh, this is on the Snilesfinis Peninsula. So again, like every corner you turn, the landscape just changes. This particular photo on the left of my friend Jackie um, jumping over over the bridge over the, the ocean, the rock bridge over the ocean. This is very Walter Mitty. Um, if any of you have seen the life of Walter Mitty, um, that particular, I think that's the name of, of the movie. That particular movie was filmed in Iceland. Um, and he, the, the title movie poster, what are they, what are they called? The, the, the movie poster. Great. Okay. The movie poster, uh, he's jumping similar to the way that my friend Jackie's jumping in this. And, and so we, we pulled it up and she did a side by side. It looked, it looked pretty cool. It's not the same place. It's not the same location at all, but it looked pretty cool. Um, so just, again, wanted to share some beautiful landscapes and then it's like, Hey, you went to Iceland. It was October. Did you see the Northern lights? Why? Yes. Yes, I did. (laughs) Um, and there was a lot of cloud cover. So we were really nervous. Uh, and the chance was very high when we went to Kirk Jafel, which is what this, um, waterfall is called right in the front of the Kirk, 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 any, or is Kirk Jafel the mountain? No, fell is waterfall. Anyway, Kirk Jafel, look it up. You'll find it on the map. There were a lot of photographers there. Most of them left. And then it was me and this guy from um, like Sweden, I think it was, who stuck around. And um, then these three women ended up showing up. And everybody's like, it's so cold. I can't believe you're staying out here. And we stayed because we wanted that break in the clouds to happen. And it happened. And we saw the Northern Lights dance across the sky. I got a couple shots while that was happening. And then the rest of the time, I just turned. And for anyone that has seen the Northern Lights and the first time you ever saw them, like, 
it was such a magical thing. It was like, I, what is this? Like, what is this phenomena that I am seeing right in front of my face? And is that even real? I don't understand. Um, and this was just a very special thing to actually experience the second time. And I, this was the first time I saw the Northern Lights ever. I hope to see them again and again and again. I, I now want to be like, I would love to have a couple trips that are just chasing Northern Lights. I think that'd be really cool. Um, I would also love to know if anybody's seen the Northern Lights while flying their airplane. Well, you know, we have some guys at work that have done that. What? Mm-hmm. I feel like that would be very trippy. All right. That's when you'd like need to be very instrument proficient, right? <laughs> well, in this case, they were in a pretty big jet, but yeah. Oh, fine. Okay. <laughs> Um, and then I can't talk about Iceland without having a couple really cool, beautiful pictures of Icelandic horses. Uh, I know I had one of me kissing a horse. Now, do they ride these horses? Are they just wild? Or what's they the do. Yeah. No, awesome question. Um, they do ride them. And there's no other horses in Iceland? None. And it's like, Il- it's horses, illegal. No one has ever smuggled one out of Iceland. I, not that I'm aware of. Okay. I mean, maybe. Gosh. That's a good Large question. Large carry on bags. Yeah, something. maybe. I like, but the, it's like illegal to bring another horse in or for any of these horses to leave the island. <laughs> um, but they, yeah, people ride them. Like you can absolutely get on a horse and go ride a horse in Iceland. They do it on the Black Sand Beach. Um, they do tours and uh, otherwise they're like, they're farm hands basically. Um, but they're they're stunning creatures. So, ho ho. Well, look at that. That's we, a super cub we know. Yeah, there's a super cub. Finally, I know we're here on supercub.org. We're here talking about Iceland. Um, but let's talk about super cubs for a second. <clears throat> um, and what happened here? So, it was Fly Oz Invitational. When was that? Uh, a few months ago. Okay, so there was this there was this thing in the land of Oz, the beautiful, wonderful land of Oz, and so, not some, the one Dorothy's from, the other one. Yeah, <clears throat> the Ozarks, and Steve uh, and Chip out here in in the beautiful NWA, um, they took some tailwheel pilots around the area just to to show them what was going on um, and experience all the backcountry strips out here. And my husband Harry. Um, was asked to to fly with one of the pilots from from the AOPA, which was pretty cool. And uh, as a result of that, Harry and I went to dinner with everyone one night, and I sat across the table from Mr. Lou Furlong and had the pleasure of uh, getting to know him over some Mexican food and uh, came up that I was headed to Iceland later in the year. And Lou says, oh, no way. You're going to Iceland. I sold I sold my experimental super cub to a guy in Iceland. And I was like, what? Tell me more. Um, he sold his super cub that he built to this guy right here, Jan Olafsson. Um, and so I was like, wow, that's incredible. That is like a dream of mine to get to f- fly and photograph a bright yellow super cub, any super cub for that matter in, in Iceland. And, you know, we start going back and forth and, and Lou shares with me about, you know, yeah, Chris Burkhardt has photo photographed the plane. I'm like, that makes sense. And I'm like, wait, your, your yellow super cub that you built, is that, that the super cub in, in a lot of his photos in Iceland? He's like, yeah. And pulls up his phone and shows me a couple and like having this moment of just, are the world is so small, like, and how special that I'm sitting across from this guy that I've seen pictures of his plane before. Like, that's really cool. And so one thing leads to another, and Steve's sitting there, and Steve's like, Lou, do you think you think we could connect Hillary with Jan in Iceland, and, and maybe Jan could take her up and and fly her, or what? What do you think? And they're like, yeah, you know, Jan's on supercub.org. Like we know the guy we've met him. Let's, let's see if we can't connect them. Um, and so heart, I feel like my heart's always connected to Lou. Um, sent, he sent a text, uh, a, shortly before my trip, maybe a month before my trip to Jan to introduce us. 
Um, so big, big, huge thanks to Lou and uh, big, huge thanks to Stephen Chip for giving me the opportunity to meet Lou. Um, and one thing led to another. And then Jan and I just start having our own conversation. And um, yeah, we, it was like, listen, October 14th is really the day that I think this is going to work out. And uh, right before my trip, like a week before, my buddy Steve over here sent a note to Jan just to double check, like, you got, you got her taken care of? Are you guys going to go fly? Like, is it looking good? And um, Jan said, yeah, but we're, we're talking. It's, it's all, we're, we're going to figure it out. But I knew to keep my expectations really low. Because again, the weather, the wind, um, the rain, those hurricane style winds that just come, feel like they come out of nowhere, right? It's like, man, that would be a bucket list dream item if I could make that happen. But it, it just, quite frankly, it probably won't. And we may not know until literally the day before or a couple hours before. So I, I had to be willing to be flexible, um, and also lean on Jan is obviously the expert. Like he's, he's the guy flying the pain. Like it's up to him if we're going to go or not. Uh, so the day before, um, Jan and I are, are kind of talking back and forth. And, um, earlier in the week, he had asked, what's your intention? <laughs> like, what, what do you want? And I'm like, mm -hmm. I want Chris Burkhard photos. Like I, <laughs> I want to fly over <laughs> these glacial rivers and I want those photos. And he's like, okay, but what do you mean? I'm like, I said, air to air. And he goes, air to air. I was like, yeah. Like, he goes, well, I thought you were flying with me. I was like, sure, fine. Is, is there any way, is there another pilot that we could, I really want to take pictures of you in your plane. Like, I'd prefer not to fly with you, actually. If I have the opportunity to, I really want to, but my goal is to actually be in another plane and to be taking pictures of your plane. And he was like, oh, okay. Um, so the day before I get a message from him via text and he says, all right, I got us another pilot. And it, so it's just like, it was crazy because the planner in me had to let go of all planning and just like <laughs> trust this guy, hope that the weather works out. Um, and so when I say like, this was a bucket list item, it was also a very spiritual moment. It just felt like one of those things in time where all the stars align and you don't know why you don't know how you don't know why the universe or God or your grandmother whose funeral you were just at, um, right before your trip to Iceland was there to like bless this moment in this day. But whatever it was, we woke up that day, that morning on October 14th, skies were clear. You can see in the picture, <laughs> skies were perfectly clear. Mm -hmm. There was no wind. And it was like, we were provisioned to go out there and just, it was written in the book huh. and in the stars for us to go fly that day. Um, so the, the cool story about this particular Super Cub is when Lou sold it to Jan, he had to update the tail number for Iceland and he named it TF Lou after the, the man that built the plane. So it, after hearing Lou's story and hearing all about the plane um, to then be there in the flesh and like, yep, there it is. There's TF Lou was, was pretty cool. Um, so I thought I'd, I'd just share some of what that looked like. Very cool. Anything you want to add before that? No, I, this is amazing. <laughs> this is amazing. I have nothing to add. Okay. I mean, I think it's really cool that he named the plane TF Lou because, know. you know, Lou has a very delicate ego being an, an mm. uh, airline pilot and what have you. So it's, it's nice yeah. anytime you can bolster that. I think it's good. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, all right. So here's uh, a little. So I just, I thought that was pretty cool. Um, so that's, that's the flying to get the shot, right? So yeah. this is the shot that came from that. Yeah. You're taking that shot while they're doing that video. Yeah. That's cool. So yeah, my friend, Laura, um, it was the most precious thing I, as a photographer or a videographer. 
you're always behind the camera, right? Like you, you rarely are in front of the camera. And my friend, Laura wrote the sweetest thing about how, um, she felt so honored to be able to take video and photos of me doing my thing. And that was really special to me to have her really be dedicated to photographing and videoing what I was doing. Um, so yeah, that's, that's an example, like that was a video of me taking this exact shot, which was pretty cool. Um, and then here's just another, of what it's like to shoot uh, photos out of a moving aircraft. So basically what we did here was um, we flew with Volcano Pilot. Uh, I, I, I do say his name wrong. If you just look at it, it's Harold Orr. Um, he corrected me many times. I will. I don't know if I'll ever get it wrong. His last name is Diego. Uh, so I. he told me I could just call him Diego. So I did. <laughs> Um, so he was in the front seat and then Laura was in the plane with me. Jackie was flying with Jan and, um, because, you know, he's scooted up in the seat. I would just get in the floor behind him and we throw the window open and key for any, anyone that's photographing with a camera that expensive is your strap is on. It is tight. You have gloves on. And like, I'm holding it as tight as possible to shoot out that window. Um, and because that's how you're going to get the clear shot as well. Like shooting through the glass, good luck. Um, you're going to have all types of refractions that you're dealing with, but shooting directly out the window, that was the key. Um, it was very, very cold, but also there was something about the adrenaline of it that <laughs> I, my fingers never got numb. Uh, my toes never got numb. It was amazing. There was something about that adrenaline that it just worked. So I just thought I'd share to finish like some of the photos that came out wow. of that trip. That's beautiful. So these are glacial fed rivers feeding out into the ocean. Um, you see the black sand beach down there. So the, the thing that's so cool about aerial flying in Iceland is just the contrast. I mean, so much contrast that you're getting. Um, again, here's some more. You have that black sand mixed in with the silt, the glacial water, um, just creating some really stunning opportunities. The other thing um, that's really important to remember is the best uh, photos that I got was when the, our, the plane was flying into the sun. So um, we wanted to be flying ahead of him um, a little bit above. He would be at our, what, like five o'clock, um, right? Mm -hmm. That's how clock works still. So he'd be at our five o'clock. This is digital. And a, li a little bit lower than us, right? And if, if we were flying into or turning into the sun or slightly turning away from the sun this way, that was the best. That, that was always the best light. So just think about that. Also increasing the shutter speed on your camera. Um, blur the prop. Yeah, okay. exactly. You want to blur that prop. Uh, what's, so, what's the speed? What, what I mean, just to, for, mm -hmm. to get technical for just a second, to get this kind of a prop blur, what are you looking for, 120 or mm, less than that? More. So one over 320 is what I was uh, had my shutter speed set at for that. Um, maybe one over 250, I would go down there, but if anything lower, you're it's not, gonna you're going to lose yeah, sharpness yeah, yeah. Yeah. on, yeah. because remember you're shooting out of the window. And even though that strap, you're going to keep some stability there. Um, it's just really important to utilize shutter speed in this scenario. And then I kept my aperture in kind of in a mid range, like really kept the aperture around or your F stop at like 5.6, anywhere from 5.6 to 8 is what, what I used. And then standard to keep your ISO as low as possible. And it was bright and sunny that day. So I kept it at 80 or 100 typically um, and used a polarizing filter um, to take the photographs as well. Different view. This is, there's a little bit of water, but this is primarily over land. Um, 
And it's just the texture too. It's like not only the contrast, but the texture mm -hmm. that you're getting. But you, there. you just never seen anything like it before. That's the amazing thing from this. I remember when I looking at Chris's photos for the first time, just thinking where it's like a different planet. Almost. It is. It's really crazy. It was mind blowing. And a lot of that black comes from, again, geothermal activity, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of it is from the lava, right. like that has been ground up over time from the water and turned into sand. Yeah, the whole island is just basically one big volcano. Yeah, right? yeah, it's stunning. Which, by the way, active volcano, um, right before this trip, like many of you may know that um, a vol active volcano was has been erupting in Iceland, uh, and they didn't know how long, like it could be erupting for, you know, a year, maybe two, like it could be erupting for 10 days. We don't know. Um, it erupted like two weeks again um, before we got there. And then the whole time we were there, it, it did not erupt. And I, it has not, it's been dormant ever since. So the last time it was actually active was two weeks before we got. So it, I was hoping to maybe fly over it, but it just, it didn't make any sense. There wouldn't have been much to see at that time. And I think this is the last, the photo to end on. Um, we see TF flew pretty sharp in there. And again, just the contrast and the different hues of blue and green in the water. Um, it was just a really, really magical experience. So anyone looking to fly to Iceland, plenty of stunning things to see from above, but do not miss what you can explore and experience on land as well. <laughs> I'm going to open it up if anybody's got, um, geez, I didn't share. Oh, what, yeah. um, anybody have any questions for Hillary while we have her here about any of this? Um, we got her, I put her website in the chat on both YouTube and, uh, and here, uh, hillarylex.com. Um, what's your, what's your Instagram handle? So I have at Hillary Lex Trex, um, one L, uh, Trex is T R E K S. And then our media page is Trip Pool Media. So that's T R I P P O O L. Um, so, yeah. David Ludwig asked if any of those cool photos made it into the Super Cup calendar. No, unfortunately, she made her trip after <laughs> all of those were chosen. Yeah, but maybe next year. Maybe next year. <laughs> Depends if she splashes them all over social media or not. You know, you know the rules. I'll I'll hold I'll hold a couple back. <laughs> Well, Hillary, this has really, uh, really been fantastic. Thank Thanks. you. You know, it's uh, you, when Laura and I were living in Kansas City, there was a direct flight to Iceland from Kansas City. In fact, some yeah. of the some of the folks that you probably met were the people that were flying flying that. Yeah. Uh, they only did it for a short time, but I just thought it was kind of on our list of things. Boy, we sure would really like to go do this and, and get you, over there. Yeah, and you have to. Still, uh, it's it is close. It's pretty close. It is. So. It was a. It's a very easy trip, um, which is one of the reasons that I think it's so attractive to get over there as well. So. Well, thank you so much for your thank time you. this evening. It was a pleasure. I appreciate and, it. And, uh, you know, folks, follow follow what she's doing. Uh, she and her uh, partner, Ashley, are doing uh, Trip Pool Media stuff. It's all really pretty neat stuff and, uh, and, and done with some of the highest quality. So thanks, Hillary. Thanks. And uh, everybody, uh, next month we'll have Paul Claus talking about Greenland. So we're going to get all those countries that are smashed together up there and try to finish those up here at the I end of the year. I can't wait for that one. So it should be good also. Yeah. Good night, everybody, and we'll see you next time. Thanks.